So you you guys you were, were the free king yeah, of the, atheists. Yeah, we were free king of atheists. atheists. We were yeah. totally free king of atheists. There is undoubtedly we were the free king of atheists. Except we had better hair. Welcome to the Rebel Love Show. We are a once a week podcast from Manchester, New Hampshire, where we are pro pot, pro gun, and pro coffee. You can catch us on Voluntary Virtues. We are on Stitcher, iTunes, and now syndicated on LRN.FM. I am Rob Mathias. And I am Shire Dude. And today's guest is none other than Carlos Morales, who is the CPS whistleblower, podcaster, YouTuber, activist, uh, and author. Author of a new book. Yeah. Amazon. So, yeah, I actually um, did what human beings are supposed to do in order to like, kind of leave their legacy for future generations, or well, at least since the last like 100 years or so, which is actually write a book rather than just produce a podcast, which I did do I, and I continue to do. Um, the book is called Legally Kidnapped The Case Against Child Protective Services, found at legallykidnapped.net. Awesome. All right, but we're not here to talk about CPS. No, that's it. We got the book. Go, kids, go. Uh, go if you if you're into that, go read it. Let me do a quick, quick, quick rundown of the book, real quick. So, as mentioned, I'm a former child protective services investigator. I worked in the state of Texas for over a year. Since then, and seeing how corrupt the agency is, from removing children for, you know, accidentally hanging out outside without their parents to parents who actually admitted to using marijuana then forcing those children into foster homes where they were regularly molested or actually murdered in specific cases uh, i do discuss a lot of those points in the book and most importantly the book has helped out hundreds of families prevent them from getting their children taken away from them so if you're interested in the topic of child protective services uh and if you want to know how to not get your kids jacked by the state go to legallykidnapped.net the book is a whole three bucks so if you can't afford three dollars, um, get a job. I don't really know what else to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you if you need help with CPS, go go buy that book. Yeah, and honestly, uh, we don't. I'm not. I don't have a Bitcoin thing for that because it's through Kindle. But um, you can send me a message on Facebook. I've had people just send me Bitcoin. I just send them the PDF, so it's all taken care of. There you go. Oh, that's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. That's actually pretty. Would you cool accept you Dogecoin? Um, it has to be at least 800 million Dogecoin oh. to get one book. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of Doge. <laughs> Is it a lot of Doge? I have no idea. I have what no the idea. Doge I don't have the conversion rate on. <laughs> Shouldn't you know that? Shouldn't you at least know like what one dollar? Your fan your base is? is gonna be upset that you don't know how much Doge is going for. How much Bitcoin is uh, is Doge going for? What's the ratio? Oh, uh, Satoshi. I, I couldn't tell you. Bitcoin's, yeah. Bitcoin's taking a dump right now. It's taking time, a time big to buy old shitter. Now. It's making me sad. It's definitely time to buy. Don't get me wrong. What is it at? Like three twenty one right now? Three hundred? Is no, it below three hundred? No, it's below three hundred. Oh God! I looked yeah. at it yesterday. It was three twenty. Well, no, no, no. Just think of it in terms of rubles. It's three million rubles. I'm sure right now. So you're good to go. Because <laughs> as long as you know, it's great. Because Russia right now is going through the drop off that the Austrians have been estimating or guessing that America would go through since the '70s. Because uh-huh. you know, like Austrians and anarcho capitalists, everything else, they're always talking about how there's going to be this economic collapse yada 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 but we are still able to go to a store and get bananas for 44 cents a pound and legitimately almost everything is insanely cheap like the fact that you can go to a store and get a head of lettuce that took six months to grow they packed that thing they shipped it off by the way there was oil involved just in the making of every single part in fact there's two calories of oil per one calorie of food that you get so there's all that push every single thing Going uninvolved just to get you your fucking lettuce and you get mad because 88 cents a pound, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that's absolutely absurd, right? So you think about all that amount of work. So for me, the idea of like hyperinflation, economic collapse for the United States, it doesn't really look all like that's going to happen soon. Although I know stats, yada, yada, yada. But when you actually look at Russia and how easy it was for that collapse to happen because they are run by a crazy charismatic tyrant who decided to stick all of his money in natural resources like oil and then the united states comes along and goes hey guess what fuckers we invented fracking which then shot down the oil prices completely eliminating the you know the market run by russia which is going to lead to that collapse we're talking in the next couple months that entire government can completely collapse 
which is fucking exciting. That's great, yeah. man. It's just interesting even, watching it from from the background. I haven't even seen uh, much in Russia. I haven't even re- been reading. Much oh well, it's, it's really in, it's really interesting what happened because oil uh, right now, if you actually look at the decline, you don't see it completely in gas prices. You you kind of see it, right? It's like oh my god, it's like a dollar cheaper or it's a dollar twenty cheaper. But that's because there's contracts by oil companies with so essentially like whenever you're setting up for an oil company to get oil in your place or something. A lot of times what people do is they sign a contract with oil companies for, okay, for the next year, this is how much it'll cost us. Well, because it prevents it from going up, supposedly, right? Well, since it's going down, that contract is still set. So you're not seeing it so much with gas prices, but you're seeing it with with manufacturing. And the reason for that is because of fracking, right? Which is going on in North Dakota, Texas, uh, Pacific Northwest. I mean, it's going on everywhere we can possibly do right now. So what was interesting was, Oil prices were shooting down, so there was a lobby that was formed for OPEC. You know, OPEC, although we don't actually get that much oil from them, everyone else does. OPEC, the thought was OPEC's prices were shooting down for oil. That's how they make all their money. So what everyone thought was kind of going to happen was that OPEC was actually going to prevent or stop oil project production in their areas so that the oil prices would shoot up. They didn't. They played the long game. Instead, they're going to keep oil production going and what they're hoping to do is that if the prices go down even more, it will no longer be economically feasible for American companies to continue to frack, right? Because if we start getting to the point where gas is costing you less than $2 a gallon, a lot of those places in North Dakota, Texas, and everything else are going to start shutting down because they can't even afford to keep it up. So it's really interesting how much oil plays a huge part into everything that's going on right now. But definitely, Russia is completely fucked. Wow. I have not tied all that together, man. I feel like I've learned something hugely new right no. now. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't tied a lot of... Uh, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't paid attention to much foreign policy of the United States since I moved. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't read much. I, drive I used a, to all the time. I drive about... Um, sometimes I drive like 200 miles in a day. And as a result, you really, really start to notice those gas differences. So I was like, why the hell is the gas getting cheaper? What's going on? And fracking's always been kind of a, a keen interest of mine. I was actually going to work for a company in Texas when I was living over there. Decided not to. Um, but fracking is is really, really interesting because there's so much misinformation as to whether or not it's a good or positive thing. And it's because it's a complicated issue. And people on the right who are, you know, everything, uh, any single thing that'll move uh, money forward is good. And then people on the left or the conspiracy folks who just think everything's bad. Well, it always turns out that it's a little bit more complicated than that. So on the topic of fracking, it's completely case dependent on whichever state's going on. Yeah. But it's really cool. Like the fact the, that the price the, going down. The, well, the price the, is going the down. It's cool. But, it, but, but the fact that North Dakota right now, just North Dakota, has enough oil there to be able to power the United States for 100 years. And that's just wow. with the technology we have right now, which is, I mean, that's absurd. The fact that it can just keep going. I've heard a lot of people that go to North Dakota just for a quick job in the oil field and get off. Oh yeah, no, you can uh, you can make two hundred thousand dollars in six months. It's really funny too because um, the companies around the North Dakota area, like McDonald's and things like that, they're paying people like eighteen or twenty bucks an hour. Not only that, if you can just get a referral for someone, they'll pay you like five hundred bucks. Wow! Whoa. Just to get someone to work there, and the reason why is because. It's a boom town. They need more people like to have jobs. Yeah, they need more people there. So do you know where the boom is really, really occurring in those areas? Hmm. What, ha- wh- what happened with the miners back in the 1800s and 1900s whenever you had these people moving to places? Prostitutes. Uh-huh. They are charging crazy numbers. Because you got a bunch of guys who are making $200,000 in six months who are sitting around doing fucking nothing in these towns. And it's all dudes. So you're saying it's a boom town. Boom <laughs> town. So, yeah, there's a huge uh, prostitution boom. And it's interesting. I mean, you have an increase in oil, i.e. an increase in prostitution in those particular areas. And so it's just it's it's like legit Wild West because Wild West wasn't actually all that violent. And North Dakota, not all that violent, but they're was plenty of pussy in both those areas. So. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, wow. making ki- all kinds of money. So you've moved a lot around the country. Yeah, from, I've moved. From multiple cults. From multiple cults, oh. indeed. And it's funny. You mentioned the uh, the cult thing. We were going to talk about this. 
So, uh, yeah, although we have to, one of the associated things is actually not a cult. So the term cult is always fun, right? It's a, it's a term that's kind of thrown around like, oh, well, you're just in some kind of crazy cult. A pejorative for any group, right? It's yeah. a pejorative. Well, and it turns out though, some things are kind of cults, right? Yeah. So if you have a charismatic leader who, if they leave, you're completely screwed. If they tell you to cut ties to all other individuals besides them, if they continuously guilt you into giving them money. That's kind of culty, right? So that's just it's case dependent on which. Yeah, don't you're don't with. donate don't donate any Bitcoin, guys. Um, <laughs> well, especially to Carlos, don't donate any money to any of us. No, no, no. Of, and so, but the thing is, is 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 here. I, I and you know, I actually lived off donations for a while. We can we talk about that for a bit okay. later. But um, but essentially, the the cult thing is, before I lived, uh, in the great state of New Hampshire, where weather is always warm, we're in a wonderful coastline. We have beaches and yeah, there's a beach there's a fucking beach but the ocean's <laughs> like a negative 20 right now might as well freeze over uh jesus even when i was there like in june for my birthday it was hilarious you'd run out into the ocean and then you just wait until your entire body got numb and then you'd run out and go that yeah. was so exciting guys yeah, I, I put my foot like i walked the beach <laughs> which was crazy because i uh i walked the beach for the first time uh after i had transformed from being a fat guy yeah all right so it's kind of like, you know, overwhelming for me to like, you know, I'm on a beach. I'm with my girl at the time and like walking the water. I'm like, all right, that's enough of the fucking water. It's like freezing cold. Like it was, it was May. It was like before, it was like the last week of May. So it wasn't even June yet. And that water was So Rob, freezing. you're a former fat guy as well. Yes, I am. We are a re- recovering fat guy uh, group. That, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I used, um, uh, although uh, I'm sure a lot of people don't actually see the video here. But yeah, I used to be like 320 pounds. I'm 195 now. I used to be 310. I am now 175, 180, man. Fist bumping with Rob right now. Fist bump. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a surprising number of recovering fat guys here, which is interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've met multiple. You're like the fourth or fifth free hmm. stater. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I mean, I, I guess it goes into, you know, whenever you're be kind of becoming a libertarian, you are taking a certain stance against uh paternalism or course of paternalism someone else forcibly taking care of you yeah and as a result you have to take individual responsibility for your life you kind of see what's going on around you and you obviously don't see a lot of peers to respect necessarily so you have to look internally to something that you can respect and if you're looking yourself in the mirror and you're 320 pounds it's hard to go yeah i fucking made it yeah. Right. No. When it's absolutely. hard to breathe when you're 18 years old and you have such bad ass reflux, every single time you drink orange juice, you vomit into the toilet. Um, from experience, um, yeah, it, it's hard to look at that and then go, hey, you know, that's that's a positive thing. No, for me, I uh, I lost my way after I kind of went through the whole libertarian, you know, rabbit hole. You know, I liberated my mind. I opened myself up uh, to all the new possibilities and everything like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I because I liberated my mind, I could liberate my body. So like, I just made the mental decision to be healthy. That's you know, for me, as soon as I got here. So Rob, you said you you were doing like the live free thing before you got here. You're into that, and then you got here and you became into the love free thing. Yes, I got into like the eat free thing, and so I've just been <laughs> eating like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my weight thing was uh, was interesting because a lot of it was very much not choice. It was a mixture of things, right? Because mine was pharmaceutical drugs that kind of caused it. Yeah, that's a different uh, perspective. It's a, it's a little bit different. So when I was like eight, my um, I had issues in school, and as a result, I was diagnosed as ADHD. Um, so I was given like Ritalin. It was seven or eight, uh, and then when I was and so I was just constantly on speed all the time, right? And as a result, I started getting a lot of anxiety issues, especially when I was around twelve or thirteen. And everyone has anxiety issues when they're in fucking middle school. That place was hell. So I ended up getting in this fight, and I'd get, in, get into a few arguments with people, so they diagnosed me with bipolar disorder, right? And so what they did was they stuck me in something called Depakote. It's a the anti-seizure um, medication also used for, for these things. And they also said I had insomnia. So they diagnosed me with, uh, or they gave me Zyprexa, which is an anti-schizophrenic medication, right? Both of these are hyper which means they cause high insulin spikes, you gain weight. Well, as a result, I was taking one drug to wake up, taking another drug to mood stabilize, and then taking another drug in order to be able to fall asleep. And my heart basically gave out, and I had to go to the hospital because my pulse was 200 beats per minute. So they had to paddle me, right? Wow. Electric paddles. 
Then they took me off Adderall, but they kept me on all the other crazy drugs. And so from the ages of 16, 18, I gained 120 pounds. Right. And then it wasn't until I was like 18 that I went to a psychiatrist who wasn't who didn't do insurance. Who's just like, what the fuck are you on right now? Why are you on all these medications? He took me off. My weight started shooting off and I was stuck on a small antidepressant. And I'm now withdrawing from my last antidepressant from eight to 27. I have always been on pharmaceutical drugs. Wow. So right now, like I'm withdrawing from my last one. I should be completely done in a month, but it's been fascinating because since I've gotten off the drugs and withdrawing, suddenly my memory is so much crisper because every single day for me was just, okay, this is today. And you, you're, you live in the moment, but in a very, very strange sense, you don't actually have emotional memory. So you'll go through a really rough breakup and you don't feel the emotion of it. It's just the next day you're like, well, I guess I'm broken up now. Now I kind of feel it and my memories have become a lot more intense, like emotionally. So I feel a lot more alive, but it's not quite like garden state where suddenly I get the fuck Natalie Portman um, <laughs> and everything's <laughs> awesome. No, because you also have to deal with fucking depression, occasional really, really mad. Like there's some s intense mania there, but with that mania comes on occasion, really intense happiness, and you feel a fucking hit of ecstasy. And I'm just like, is this what like real people feel? You know? Wow. And it's this like numbness that is finally going away. So like and now, I'm, and I'm pissed off the fact that I didn't have that for 19 years. Do you feel now like you're really living because you're not you're not under all these depressants? I feel like I've always been living, but I feel like I'm I'm living a little bit more, you know, uh -huh. because I can't give my I, I can't live in the past and go, oh, now I'm mad because I didn't feel the things I felt in the past, because um, that that does absolutely nothing, you know, to accept kind of serenities, accept the things that you can actually have an ability to choose or change. Uh, rather than look at the past, you can ex you can look at the past, and learn something, but to live back there is retarded. Then then you're just the guy who's always talking about how great it was that he was on the football team in high school. You don't want to be that asshole. No. So instead, you know, I'm starting to kind of embrace and feel things a bit more, which is, which is great. And and I'm hoping about when I'm completely off this, that it'll be all right. I'll tell you this much though, concentration wise, I'm so much fucking better. Oh, I can imagine. You don't have that cloud over you. Yeah, I d I like, I'm just like, okay, I need to get this thing done now, and then I go do it. And I feel that kind of productivity so much more. Um, and it's a really wondrous kind of intense feeling. I'm uh, digging it. All right, well, get get it. Is that what you uh, use for your book? Huh? Would you have been able to do your book if it hadn't been on well, all uh, this? Well, the, the, that's, that's impossible to know, right? Like, the, the book was really a result of... Uh, a year and a month, a year and a couple months ago, uh, last September, last September, I, I came out against Child Protective Services, like with the actual podcast. But the thing is, I had actually moved out of the state. Basically, I got divorced, right? I was married, and then I quit. I was, and then I ended up getting divorced, and I was like, okay, well, I'm, apparently, I'm not going to have any kids anytime soon. I fucking drove immediately the day after my divorce out of the state to North Carolina. I was like, well. I'm taking a huge risk because I can get shot for what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I could go to jail, but I have no one that's relying on me, right? Yeah. I have, uh, there's there's no one who's not going to be fed if I do this. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who can help. Um, so after I came out against the agency, I started doing all these podcasts and videos and things like that, kind of doing stuff. And I started doing a lot of legal help with people, which I started living off donations, honestly, is because I was doing 200 emails a day, you know, fucking okay this is how you do this, this is how you do this and this is how you do this but realistically you're making nothing an hour and I was really busting my ass because I was trying to in a sense tone for my sins but also trying to kind of find myself in a way mm -hmm. um, and then it was a realization that okay I can send people 30 podcasts and hopefully they can decipher and remember exactly what to do or I can give them a hundred page book and see what I can do with that and thankfully the book did really well uh, I released it for free for like three days got something like eight or 10,000 downloads in like two days and it got number one in all nonfiction on Amazon. There's like 200,000 books. That's For, huge. And by the way, the book is fucking anarchist as shit. I don't even, I don't even play around. Like the <laughs> end is just like, there is no reform. The government, the, uh, the CPS works exactly how the government works. It's a microcosm for the state. This is why we need to annihilate this entire thing. We need to go back to 
uh, since we're not go back to we're not going back. Oh, fuck conservatism. We're progressing in the future without violence, which isn't something that's ever existed. But we're rather acknowledging the fact that we have a played a part with other individuals who are, we are working with in our own lives. And so to externalize or try to project the change that we want to have through some kind of voting mechanisms is absolutely worthless. So if we want to have an end to child abuse, we don't do it by, um, you know, moving the locus of control from the individual onto an external authority that is a course of monopoly. Instead, we actually go out and say, hey, this is not the right way to raise children. And secondly, of course, realize the fact that it is a course of paternalistic agency, which then, you know, is ever domineering across so many different families that has led to, I mean, there's 350,000 children in in uh, CPS care right now, just in the United States, Mm -hmm. right? That's a fucking catastrophe. So I felt that if I could catalog that and put it in a way that makes sense easily for people to be able to decipher, that's, you know, that's the best benefit I could have for society and myself in this particular case because in part it was almost me washing my hands. Yeah. Now, in, in the sense of, okay, I can keep releasing these fucking videos and maybe some people will see them. And some of them, you know, like I had a podcast, I had like 45,000 downloads. I was like, holy shit. But still, that I'm only speaking to the people who already are searching out for that. What about the people who, you know, you just message your your mom, you know, oh, did you hear about this thing? Well, if they listen to my podcast, they can hear like crazy audio edits and like this really intense production, but they still don't get it because right? yeah. it's not in their hands. And as a result, um, I will state though, in regards to the book, there there was a little bit of criticism because there's a little bit of issues of grammar. Um, <laughs> uh, there's 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 a few like tiny fucking grammatical issues that people hobnobbed about, and so I'm paying someone a boatload of money to re-edit the whole book with Bitcoin uh, to fix stuff up, and then I'm going to print it out, and it should be ready to go in March, like a second edition. Okay. Um, but even if if you pick it up right now, it's not like you're not you get the second edition for free. You, you just it just re-updates. Oh, that's cool. So, that's awesome. So yeah, that's everything about CPS. So let's get yeah. back to more. Well, hey, you yeah. probably I was just, I was yeah. just telling you that you know you got off hey, of drugs and you wrote a book. Congratulations. I do. I'm in a bit of a tangent oh, right now. Man. I know. So I'm all good to go. All right. So going tangent wise, what was your first cult like? Okay. So well, my first cult was actually the Catholic Church. Right. Oh. We keep we keep going back in time. Well, my my first cult was 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 the Catholic Church, right? Because yeah. I was an altar boy for the Catholic Church. I actually did like life teen. Uh, uh, something that I think everyone pretty much gathers from me after meeting me for five minutes is that whatever stance I have, I'm fucking passionate about it. Yeah. So I was really afraid that all my friends are going to go to hell. When I was a kid. That was the thing. It was like, because yeah. were, you were constantly in this concern because this, this great fucking domineering asshole in the sky was going to send a lot of people to hell who did not accept the word, the word of Christ. Right. And it says, it's pretty clear in the New Testament, right? The only way to heaven is through me, through Jesus Christ. What about all those assholes in China? What are they going to do? So I started getting really, really obsessed with the Catholic Church to the point of, um, I remember what really, really kicked it for me. Do you remember those the hell houses? No. They no. were a thing for like a second. It was mostly in the South. Um, and uh, they were essentially these, these churches. On Halloween, they would scare the hell into you, right? So I talked to my dad. And we were like, uh, I was like, oh, my, my friend uh, said that there's some crazy, scary house at a church. And it was really, really intense. And my dad was like, are you sure you want to go? I was like, yeah, I want to go. I want to go. And I think about it now. I'm like, this is before then. And that was really getting huge. So my dad had to like go out of his way to figure out what the hell this thing was. So we go over to this place in this long line. And so we, we get into this, this room in this, this dungy church. And a demon comes out, right? This guy dressed up like a demon. I think about it now. I'm just like, I would punch that guy in a fucking dick right now. <laughs> but because he's a bunch of kids. And he goes, and he's like, what you are going to see is why people go to hell, right? So he's trying to scare us, right? And so what he does is he goes, but no one's going to touch you, right? So no one's going to hurt you. Okay, thanks, guy. You know, fucking 12-year-old. And so we go to the first room. And what they're doing, there's plays in every single room. So the first room, you see a large Mexican man beating the shit out of his wife, right? And this little girl comes out, and she takes a gun. And here's the thing, the acting from my memory. Now, mind you, a whole section of my book is about how bad eyewitness reports are. So we are judging by my memory here. The little girl that shoots her dad, and she's screaming really loud, and the demon is talking to us about, about temptation, while all this is going on, mind you, 12, 
right? I was like, what the fuck? So that was the first part of to scare us. The next part, though, that's where it really got greasy. So this, uh, this, it's a fake doctor's office, right? And there's this uh, woman, and she's in stirrups, and she's talking to a doctor. And she goes, yeah, I had a lot of fun on spring break, and my friend said that if you're pregnant, you guys take care of it, right? And he's like, yes, yes, everything will be taken care of, madam. Everything will be taken care of. So he uh, he starts talking to the woman, and he's like, just just wait one second. And he's <laughs> he takes out a screwdriver, oh. right? A fake screwdriver. Okay. And, and he's thrusting it into her legs. Now you're not exactly seeing what's going on here, yeah. and she, and you hear a baby scream. Oh, and it's gosh. a. And you hear the fucking screwdriver going into the brain. The woman's like, I was told that it wasn't actually a baby. I was told it wasn't a baby. And he goes, it's nothing, dear. It's nothing. And he's fucking killing this baby. And then the woman dies, right, during the abortion. And then apparently she goes to help. That has so, it so quickly. Wow. Yeah. There's a few more rooms, which are all like car accidents and stuff like that. My favorite, though, was at the very, very end, there was a, uh, a black guy. And he's standing over a, a uh, coffin. And he's like, I loved you so much. I loved you so much. It was actually a dude, and he died of AIDS. And because he was a faggot, he went to hell. Jesus. Yeah, no shit. Jesus, what a guy. <laughs> so then what they do is they scare us. Those are all like the sins, right, according to them. And so then we end, they actually bring us to hell, right, like into this layer that looks like hell, like, like hands are coming out of prison things and everything else. This is really theatrical stuff. You know they had a lot of crazy Jerry Falwell money behind it. And he hears crazy just sounds, everything else. And then out of nowhere, in the back, you hear Ric Flair music. <laughs> do, 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 do. And it's a projecting huge light, and it's Jesus Christ. And he's like, I can save you. I can save you. So we all run to Jesus, right, because he's going to save us. And he takes us to this room, and he's telling us about hell and everything else. is Jesus Christ. And this woman runs into the room. And she goes, why am I in hell? I went to church on Sundays. I'm Catholic. And then demons grab her. And they go, you didn't do enough. And they fucking pull her out. Because she was like a, a laxy Catholic. Wow. Right? She didn't go to church often enough. She wasn't giving enough. And that, that was, to me, with CPS, with I had kids pull a gun out on me. I walked in the house that's filled with shit. I have seen way more fucked up stuff than anyone ever needs to see. That is still the most scarring thing that I ever went through. Jesus Christ, that, man. I, that's I, like fucking horrible. That's, I, that is the most culty thing I've heard. Yeah. So that that's why I say the Catholic Church was my first uh, cult. I, I I believe you now. <laughs> I understand you so much more now. Yeah, that, 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 that explains your personality a lot. That, that, I, that would scar anyone. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So how did you, how'd you move on from... Uh, Catholicism. Well, yeah, Catholicism was interesting because uh, I got really, really intense into it. But it's always interesting because a lot of times the people who are the most intense into something um, that are faith-based are because they they question it most often, right? So you have to radically believe it more and more and more. Uh, what are we looking at time-wise, by the way, just so I know? Um, you got another... Uh, oh, we're, 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 keep going. We're good. Okay, okay, fair oh, enough. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, it was it was uh, it was interesting though because I, I had this friend who I had like since I was like seven years old, but he was never religious. We just never really talked about it. And I was like fifteen, and I started really wondering about the church thing because I started having questions in my own church. I was like, "Is there a God? I don't know if there's a God." And my friend was telling me that he was reading Nietzsche, and I was like, "Well, that's interesting." So I started reading some of him. I bought like this book that explained nihilism. And, uh, and then I looked it up on Wikipedia, and I was like, okay, well, nihilism, so that seems interesting. So I started reading a bit about atheism from there. And then me and my friend, we'd look up on TV, and we switched the channel, and there's titties on the TV. I was like, what's on TV? <laughs> Turns out it was Penn and Tally's bullshit. Oh, nice. So we start watching that show, and we're like, oh, wow, this is interesting. And he started talking about atheism and stuff. We're like, what the hell? Yeah, Penn's a huge atheist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, yeah. I still listen to Penn Sunday School. He is my fucking, he's my Jesus. Um, totally. Now, uh, from there, I hear about Ayn Rand, and I hear about atheism at the same time. So thanks to the internet, I started just really, really reading about atheism, 
and it was the Atheist Debater's Handbook, which is actually a handbook for atheists to debate Christians that I read while a Christian totally got me. I was like, no way. This is a crazy-ass old book written by bigots who want to control other individuals that is filled with contradictions. As an atheist, right now, if there is anything out there, I can guarantee you it has nothing to do with the Old and New Testament. So I became, when I saw the fact that I was being lied to, that I was being proselytized, that there was a hell, that some ancient book that completely controls individuals' lives, right? Because it's, it's, it, to me, it's worse than the government because it controls your mind, right? It's, con- it's the truest form of dictatorship because it's thought crime. It, it, it makes you worried of thought crime, right? Because it's not just what you externalize and do. It's about the feeling of temptation, that can actually bring you to hell. And I'm trying to remember, it's Luke 19. There's a quote from Jesus that says the only unforgivable sin is to reject the Holy Spirit, right? That's a mental crime. That means you can fuck a kid and you can get away with it, but if you reject him in your mind, then that is the most evil thing you can do. And seeing that and, and feeling the pain that I felt in my chest as a result of seeing that, that kind of... Um, the pain that's being caused on other individuals made me start up um help start up an atheist group in uh in texas uh called atheist agenda were you doing this when you were still in this uh, doing cps work no, no this is this is way way before way this before is like college right the, i this is i was 18 when i started up in college and um uh there was this group called like atheist agenda they had just gotten started and we were talking over some stuff like little events and one of the ideas that got kind of popped up and talked about was some called um, porn. Okay, so essentially, churches. What they did was you could turn in pornography, and you'd get back a Bible. So we were like, "Fuck you! Why don't we flip that?" And so we invented this little event called Smut for Smut, where individuals were able to turn in their holy scripture for pornography. Reason being, if you want to talk about demoralizing towards women, what is my demoralizing towards women? a text that well no, excuse me pictures that involve them being naked versus a text that states that you know moses goes into an entire tribe decides to annihilate everyone for believing in the wrong things decides to kill all the old women and tell all of the men to keep the virgins for themselves and do with them what they'd like right that's way worse than any porn ever so we started that up and i started up the smut for smut thing ended up getting to meet like sean hannity and a bunch of other assholes on slow news days and that's kind of how I got it started doing this kind of stuff. Wow. I did atheist activism for like six years. I got to meet Dawkins, Shermer. I uh, didn't get to meet Hitchens before he died. I got to meet Sam Harris. I got to go through that whole gamut. Wow. And so my background is was forever was atheist activism. I'm still an atheist activist in a sense, but um, that was like I was hardcore into that shit. I'm kind of stuck in the whole smut for smut uh, spiel. So you're <laughs> telling me that... It's performance art. A church, yeah, I, I get it, but a church was giving away Bibles for porn, and you were giving away porn for Bibles. Mm-hmm. That arbitrage market must have been fantastic. Because like some porn DVD is like what twenty five dollars. Not that I know, but they're like twenty five dollars <laughs> a DVD. <laughs> oh, okay, so it was interesting. We uh, uh, at first what we had, we just got some like porn mags, uh-huh. and then we went to Craigslist. This is so fucking funny. <laughs> oh, no. There was a thing that actually said. Selling 50 pounds of porn for $50. They measured it by the pound. <laughs> so we were like, we're fucking set. <laughs> so we went over there, and we ended up getting 100 pounds of porn. They had more. Wow. How did they have so much porn? Oh, it was 100 pounds of porn. It was, it was an ex-wife, right? And her husband had left, like, Iraq. And he had he was a porn addict or something. And she was like, I'm selling all this. And I talked to her about what we were doing. And she was totally cool with it. I gave her 50 bucks. We got 100 pounds of porn. I mean, heavy boxes. <laughs> and we were good for like fucking five years on that. Wow. We were good to go. But we got a, uh, we did get a thumbs up from Larry Flint, which was like the biggest Excellent. whoop ass. Dude, that's that so awesome. hardcore. But it was funny because uh, the atheist community, they f- a lot of those pussies hated us because they were like, this is what's wrong with atheism. I was like, yeah, what's wrong with atheism? In fact, they're talking about us and not you. So you, you guys you were, were the freaky yeah, of the, atheists. You're we were freaky of atheists. atheists. We were yeah. totally freaky of atheists. There is undoubtedly we were the freaky of atheists. Except we had better hair. Oh, <laughs> oh so um, and way more women. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Speaking of way more women, I really wanted to get to you said you drove to North Carolina earlier. 
Why mm. would you do a thing like that? Oh wow, we're 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 jumping ship yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, so I moved to North Carolina for the essentially right after the divorce. I was like in this pretty intense state where I was like, what the fuck am I going to do now? And I was thinking about the Free State Project because that had already been a pork fest. But I was worried that when I got there, I, d- I didn't have a job or anything. I was like, I don't know what the hell to do. And I didn't really know anyone there. The only person I knew in Free State Project was Brett Vanat. School sucks. Like, that's it. That's the only guy I knew. Um, and I had been talking to Chase and Justin of the Blue Ridge Liberty Project. And they were like, hey, we have a place for you to stay. You can start help run out our business over here. We can knock all this out. I was like, fuck it. Asheville is gorgeous. It still is the prettiest place I've ever been to. It's ridiculous. So I drove up and I lived in, uh, I worked at the Blue Shelby Project for like eight months. Wow. Yeah. And they still love you there, man. Like, yeah, yeah. Still, still yeah. mad love. Yeah. No, no. I, st- I, st- I still love the people at the Blue Shelby Project. Um, I moved to the Free State Project because there was, more libertarians up here and there was a bigger nest for me to be able to kind of work with of individuals blue Liberty project is great if you, especially if you if you have like kids and shit yeah they're it's big on the peaceful parenting. they're big yeah. on the peaceful parenting thing they're big on community things like farming stuff like that it's a great place for for that kind of thing hmm. um i and i always do argue you know when someone brings up well the free state project is some of that i'm like okay i and I, i'm with you but like you Not would never as much of an emphasis. No. no, you would never have something like the quill at the f- at Blue Reserve Project. Yeah. Every event you're going to go to is family friendly. You're going to be cool to go. Um, stating that though, even if you don't have family, if you're in Asheville, North Carolina, where there's three females to one male ratio, there's the lowest BMI in the country. There's more breweries than you could possibly ever shake a stick at you have a 20 to 28 year old range that is massive over there if you're a single man and are moderately good looking it is a great place to be especially <laughs> after a divorce oh, man. um no one will ever say that about the free state project mm-hmm. uh so there are huge benefits to the brlp i'm glad i'm here i'm glad i'm working at the free state project now um and i'm totally cool with that but you will never find me being the person who's like fuck those guys because justin and chase i have to thank justin for nearly, I mean, such a massive amount of why anyone even knows the hell I am. Yeah. He has such a huge network for social networking. Like, you know, my podcast was like 50 people before it, uh, before I moved over there. Now, of course, my message is what mattered, but people needed to know I even existed. And he really pushed the shit out of me. He pushed the hell out of no, the book. I mean, I mean he's great. Like, for me, like, I know there's a lot, sometimes there's hate between people in the Blue Ridge and uh, FSP and whatnot. Um, I'm all for the whole, you know, just I'm nice to those guys. Like I've, I'm I not everyone fucking friends. wants no. to move to New Hampshire. No, not <laughs> No, I hear you. I, I yeah. get. I've, uh, I've seen like the arguments on both sides. I saw the whole spat that went down with Chase and Carla and whatnot, and like, I don't know. Um, I, I, I hope, I hope them success. You know, but I'm obviously here. But I mean, for me. Well, let's and and we can cut the brass tax on this particular things. They are more; it's more of a selective, exclusive type of group thing, and yeah. that's different. The free it's state very project. niche. Let's be honest here. Yeah. Um, with the free state project, yeah. If we get twenty thousand people who randomly decide to move here, I'll probably like five percent of them, and I'm guessing a huge percentage will end up being Christian nutters who vote. Right? For me, that doesn't actually move anything towards liberty at all. Right. If you believe in voting, if you're like a if you're a libertarian party type of a candidate guy and you love shoving Jesus down people's throats, go fuck yourself. um, Because you're you matter to me as far as liberty is concerned about as much as I don't know, Mitt Romney. Like for me, like I don't mind the minarchists that come here. I didn't come here as a minarchist, but people do. I'm fine with that because most Minarchist people, to me is different than what I, I just, well, yeah. yeah, I mean you got well, no, there are Christians that come in here. Yeah. See, I'm on the other side of that. Like for me, um as long as they're not trying to force me to do something, I don't really care what they have in their mind. It's the philosophical argument is what matters more than anything else for me at least. Faith is the number one issue. Faith is the problem when it comes to government, faith is the But problem. what if they're completely peaceful? It's about the locus of control. Right. Here's the thing. If your knowledge base or the way that you find reason is through an external authority figure, that external authority figure can change its mind. 
right? So God could be, well, if God's peaceful to me right now, well, God could switch on a hat and your moral compass is related to that, right? So if your morality is not based off of some kind of reason, if your knowledge basis and your understanding of epistemology is not understand it grounded in reality, rather through some kind of external thing, that causes a fundamental issue. For me, methodology matters just as much as the answer that you get, right? So we can both agree, it's, it's a philosophical uh, conundrum kind of thing. If we're both agreeing on the NAP, aren't we both fine? Not necessarily in the long run, because if your NAP is based off of some crazy ass book, right? If you actually start to take that crazy ass book seriously, you'll see, for instance, the Old Testament, God is not an NAP kind of guy. He's a, I'm going to flood the entire world kind of a guy and fucking drown babies, right? Because they believed in the incorrect God, even though he never even wrote out which God to believe in. Bit of a loophole, guys. Yeah. Bit of a loophole. Oh, by the way, and then finally, whenever he does predict, whenever he does kind of decide to do that, at one point he actually wanted to kill Moses. But do you know what his Moses' wife did? She cut off the foreskin of one of their children, rubbed that foreskin on the feet of Moses, and then God goes, "My bad, I'm not going to do that today." See, if your reason. And your your philosophical thinking comes from that. We got an issue. That's why I always carry around a little pouch of foreskin on me. Now, I'm not a statheist, though. The thing is, atheists can be just as big of Nazi oh, progressives. Yeah. You, the progressive movement of the United States was one of the worst things that's ever happened, right? Like, ever in yeah, history. Absolutely. The eugenics movement started in the United States. That was, a, that was a result of it. And a lot of those guys, uh, Francis Galton, for instance, the guy who co uh, coined the term eugenics, was the second cousin of Charles fucking Darwin, right? Yeah, weren't the Nazis like contacting scientists in California and stuff? Uh, there was, uh, there was actually a, uh, there was a scientist in uh, the United States who was eugenicist who stated uh, the Nazis are doing better at our game that we invented. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, oh, Hitler, this is during Hitler, was, Hitler was inspired by the eugenics movement. He was, yeah. although to be fair, Hitler, Hitler was inspired by a lot of shit. That guy was nuts. Because he considered himself like he was very, very Christian, according to him. But he had all this like weird pagan stuff mixed in there and some weird eugenicist stuff. Now, his views on the Jews thing, that wasn't completely eugenic space. That was also during the end of World War One. Israeli banks did give money to the British in order to be able to shoot over the Germans in order to be able to essentially ensure Israel afterwards. As a result, you ended up having the Treaty of Versailles, which then destroyed the German economy. So shooting it as the Jews of the enemy in this particular case, when they were the bankers who then funded their enemy, you can make that argument. There's already kind of a culture behind that. So eugenics, certain aspects of the eugenics movement were taken from you know, progressives. Um, but within the United States, the eugenics movement was more tilted towards what was codified as savages. Now, of course, I mean, not of course, a lot of people don't know this. But Irish people were considered uh, lower than niggers. Um, uh, we're talking about until the early 1900s. Yeah, right? they were the first. No, no Irish need apply. <laughs> yeah, they were the first slaves in the United States. It was actually white people. Uh, now, so they were they were uh, gone against as far as um, their particular race. So were Native Americans. So were black people. Um, and there was there was like all these scholarly books about what was considered like the best versions of whites, uh -huh. right? It was great. And uh, in the United States, there was 100,000 people forcibly sterilized in the course of 1904 to 1974. Also ca also brought up in my book, <laughs> Chapter 1, The Truth About Child Protective Services. Yeah, it turns out like CPS it has like its founding in like eugenics movement. Really? I didn't even know that. No one did, actually. I, I had to uh, put it all together. And, uh, and it, the, the history of CPS is really, really weird because like there hasn't been – libertarians have not hit that shit hard enough. I can tell. Like you're the only one out there that I know of that yeah. has gone and talked about that. I'm also their first whistleblower who was actually libertarian. Which is pretty cool. That's exciting. Isn't it exciting? I didn't even I didn't even think of it that, that way. You That's are great. like one of the first libertarian, like huge whistleblowers. No, I'm the, I'm the first in CP well CPS. Well, CPS period. I mean, I guess, See, no, yeah. every single whistleblower against the agency against child protective services has asked for political reform. Has asked for we need more money. Right, they're always fucking weasels, and I, t I think I said in the video, I was like, should I release this? I was like, yeah, I'm gonna release this. I was like, go jump off a bridge. You're doing more. You, you're doing more harm than good, because you are making the argument that that this is something that needs to continue, 
and in truth it doesn't we need this uh, the state needs to end the, the leviathan needs to go away and reason needs to succeed um and the only way that we can truly achieve that is for the methodology to be as consistent as the end message yeah the entire organization is based on a flawed premise that you need the state to take care of those children <laughs> Yeah, w b the basic message here is that we need less people to think that the state should be our parents. Yeah. Right? What kind of, uh, like, attention have you gotten outside of libertarian circles being a whistleblower of that kind? So it's been interesting. Um, here's the very, very interesting thing about my audience base. I don't really share it with anyone else because it's like a lot of it is like single moms who are very, very impoverished or single dads, people in really fucked up situations. A lot of them are nearly illiterate, like who listen to my podcast, which is actually really exciting. So I don't have a lot of people who listen to Steph. I have some, I actually have a good percentage who listen to Brett, because Brett Venata School Sucks has like, I didn't start my podcast uh, except for, if, uh, I started my podcast because of him, like because he was a whistleblower in a way. Yeah. Um, so his, he's done so much to help me out there. Um, but a lot of them are just like people who are, a lot of them were religious, like religious homeschooling moms who are partially illiterate. And then they listen to my show and I, and they're like, oh my God, he's speaking the truth about child protective services. Finally, like a lot of these people are victims. And then I throw in like, have you heard of argumentation ethics? Let me tell you about this atheism thing. And it's great because you're just throwing it on. They've never heard any of this shit before. So you get a completely fresh new audience that you get to, to spar with. You get to have some fun with because I get messages that are, you know, interesting because there will be uh, the, the anarchy thing has been easier to sell than I, than I thought it would. It's, it's been really interesting with my show because sometimes I'll listen to other people's shows talking about CPS now that I didn't listen to in the past. Uh -huh. And they bring me up a lot. Uh, and it's really, really strange hearing them talk about it because they're like, yeah, he talks about this anarchy thing. It's really interesting. And like, so one person's like, well, yeah, parenting is constitutionally right. And then the guy responds with like, it's not about the constitution. Remember, they're slave owners. <laughs> so it's, it's a natural right. And I'm like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. So it's getting to like explain anarchy and, and the philosophical revolution is completely different audience than Hans Hermann Hoppe would ever hit up. You know yeah. what I mean? You, you've, you've hit like a, a weird thing. This weird niche of yeah. like people, like this whole group of people who never would have been introduced. At to all. Yeah. No, because a, a lot of them are kind of like, they'll like bring up the constitution. But I'm like, I guarantee you, you've never read it. Read it. It's a piece of shit. It totally <laughs> justifies murder. Like it justified slavery, right? Yeah. The government we have now is a natural byproduct the, of the Constitution. The only thing I've ever agreed with George Bush on, the Constitution is nothing more than a goddamn piece of paper. Yes. Yeah. Snap. That that I would gladly wipe my ass with. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't so rough. Because I need that <laughs> cotton L. I like that soft quilted hey, stuff. Just be careful because there's a map on the back. No, they, that's the Declaration <laughs> of Independence. The Declaration of Independence. Uh, Never mind. Go. Yeah. <laughs> and Johnny Cage. No, not Johnny Cage. Nicholas, Nicholas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Cage. Uh, all right, kids. All right. Um, so, Carlos, we're heading out, hitting the hour mark. Where can people find you at? Okay. Uh, LegallyKidnapped.net is where you find the book. Go to TruthOverComfort.net to find um, – you can also find the book through there, but you can uh, you see my podcast videos. I've been really, really laxed on releasing a lot of stuff lately because I've been wicked busy. Um, but videos and podcasts are using out. local slang. I've been I'm using impressed. Wicked for a long time, though. Now it's now everybody also uses it, which is great. Like no, I moved I here. Refuse. No, I, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm still, love. I'm wicked. not going to use it yet. It's a good word. I Dude. felt Wicked almost come out of my mouth the other day, and then I, I held it back. I, I'm still holding back. I can't. I can't. <laughs> no, I can't, is a I can't take the step yet. Wicked is a great word. But uh, okay. but anyway, truthovercomfort.net. Uh, you can find the article and everything else through there. Again, the book is like three bucks. Just throw some money. If you want to do it through Bitcoin, message me at face pages thingy. <laughs> and I love you, you all. And, uh, and and thank you for, man, I just talked to that entire goddamn thing. Yeah, you, yeah, you did. You did a good job. Yeah. I've learned a lot. All right, fantastic. Yeah. All right, Shardy, where can they find you? Oh, wait, wait. Oh, you man. you released a new episode. Um, it's about goddamn time you I released announce, a new episode. It's been months. It's been months. Uh, but I finally released episode nine. It's called Keenvention. It hit the front page of freekeen.com today. 
And uh, you, you, you posted it there, didn't you? Of course. <laughs> but free, I'm free don't be don't be pulling com. a desert leagues and like the saying, "Oh, the free king <laughs> picked up this article." I didn't like, say come that. on! I didn't like he posted you posted it. It's just really cool that something that I did. You know, Facebook so picked up my uh, my post today. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the Carlos Morales page. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's actually my favorite episode so far. So you can find that at shiredude.com. All right, you can find my content at therebel.com. You can find the show at rebelloveshow.com. Go like us on uh, Facebook. Subscribe to us on Stitcher or iTunes, whichever you prefer. And uh, go check out lrn.fm because we're now on it, bitches. All right, peace. Peace. That was my favorite podcast ever. Awesome. <laughs> That's a problem. If you do a show where you constantly, we can talk about something. Yeah, yeah. Let me grab some water. Vocal warm ups, everyone. Vocal warm ups. La, 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 la. Actually, you know, I think I actually like it. Rather than attempting to contact aliens. Hi, my name's Dan. I'm an Asian American. Wait, you're doing my bit. Yeah, that's from you. Wow. <laughs> How often do I say that? No one's ever repeated that back to me. Just wait until the bloopers come out from It's Like This too. I've got a compilation of, like, I don't know, the last everyone that we've done. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, <laughs> I mean, my name's Dan. I'm an Asian American. <laughs> you do that, that little slip. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's pretty oh, good. Hold on. All right, there you go. I love Jesus. You love Jesus. <laughs> we should talk about your love for Jesus on the show. Yeah, absolutely. The fact that I was an altar boy. Oh, wow. Really? Oh, there's there's so many stories. No, I want to go. Dude, I, God, I wish we were doing like a three-hour show, but I do not. No one, no one here has time for that. No. Well, that's why we Well, if you, if you blow it out of the water, you can be a repeat guest. Yeah. That would be awesome. All uh, right. Dude, I would love to do that. Okay. I like shows where there's actual people. That I'm talking to you rather than through Skype. I, fucking, I hate. I fucking hate Skype with a I passion. I hate Skype. I hate Skype. I will never do a Skype show. It's never. I'll go on other people's shows to do Skype, but anything I ever do is going to be in studio it's, guests all the time. For me, it's impossible. I, I mean, just I, I. There's not enough free staters dealing with CPS for me to be able to do just with people there. Yeah. Mm. No, I completely, completely agree. All right. He really looks way too much information, right? I know her favorite movies, her favorite music. I know who her friends are, what kind of my, like, humor is he like, you know. What like, is I, that I, man? I know, I know all this crazy stuff, right? And so we go out, and I'm like trying to, trying to, uh, uh, under, you know, like on the down low, like use the information that I know, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I went all out. Like, I had a mixed CD <laughs> in my car <laughs> of music that I knew she would like. Okay. Right? But that I liked, too. Right? Nothing. She didn't respond to any of it. None of it. It wasn't her Facebook? It was, yeah, it was all on her Facebook. But she didn't really say, oh, I like this song or, you uh, know, like, if, we were, like, if like I brought up a movie in conversation. That means she's basic. Nothing. She didn't respond to any of it. Maybe she's just... Doesn't have a good personality. Yeah, yeah right. She's a basic ass. Bitch. Some people are just lame. It's not Say a bad it. thing. It's not a crime. Say it. Well, Say that. Say what I just, I'm just said. Saying I, had I all just want to hear you. And none of it was useful. Yeah. Are you sure you used it correctly? Yeah, <laughs> I don't think you did. Because if a guy did that on the first day, I'd, I'd make mental notes. There are a few other side notes to the story. One is that every time I messaged her on Facebook and I was really, really drunk, she messaged me back. And every time I messaged her sober, she never messaged me back. So that tells you something about your personality. And then the other thing is... <laughs> you're a lady killer when you're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing <clears throat> is, I met her when I had a beard, and I shaved the beard before the date. Oh. No. Yeah. No, that was a that was a killer. Was that was a killer. Back. She didn't... If you. She just wanted the beard. She did. You don't love me, bitch. You just love my beard. Exactly. Yeah. I've had that experience. <laughs> like, hey, you better yes, look how I your picture beer. says. I love beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I How have dare you? Braided in my beard that says I'm up here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I myself, if I take my beard off, I look like the Gerber baby. Yeah. Like I literally look like I'm 12. Like, That's disturbing. I know because women have actually 
rethought the status of our of the status of our relationship based on how much younger I look. They're like, I they're like, hi, Jeremy. I don't think so. It's no, it's all based you, on the I don't want you to look like my little brother. That's how I base the status of our relationship. Yeah, you don't like me when I when I shave. When he shaves, he's on his own. <laughs> well, sometimes it gets too long, man. Sometimes I just need to. I like to hit the reset button because it grows back. I, so I do quickly. that too. Yeah, it's literally like five days. Yeah. It's like. Maybe maybe four. Like it's I not that, and, and that's to, to the point where like it looks it. like I have a beard. Yeah, but sometimes I just need a. I need a reset. Men just need to stop shaving. Thank okay, you. Stop just shaving. stop. I regret it every stop. time I do it. The thing is but you bad. trim it. Why do you yeah, Why do you trim it? Mm. Why are you trimming your beard? Why are you trimming your beard? Stop because, it. Because I don't want to look like one of those fucking neck crazy libertarian people. I want you to have <laughs> That's why. Hair I'm trying to bring some class to this joint. Like, like by to trimming me, my beard. Like, 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 to me, this is literally, to me, this is insanely long. Mm-hmm. Like, this is too much. No, like, I'm going like to have to trim it a little bit. Like that, yeah, I don't like the whole... See, yeah. see, it's, you know it's, it's cool when like it comes up on the cheekbones. This like sounds Viking like style, if a bunch of girls then, were talking about getting breast reductions right now. You know, I write manifestos in the woods and stockpile weapons. I write greeting cards. You're, like, you know. you're taking away yeah. the, the flair. 